everybody for our ceremony for Dr. Governor Lyman Hall, 300 years old with one day. I'm very proud to be the superintendent of the Center Street Cemetery and all these years be able to take care of this patriot. So, Lisa Zolkowitz Ives, she has been our singer of the National Anthem for many, many years in Wallingford. Remove your caps, please. Face the flags. Our National Anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming and the ragged wriggly, the bombs bursting in air, came through, through the night that her flag was still there. Oh, say does that star spangled I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. here, the members of the town council, we certainly appreciate this. This is a very historic moment, Wallingford having a sign of the Declaration of Independence. We're celebrating his birthday, 300 years old. And with that, there has been a man, a mayor, who has supported this cemetery in all the things that we've done here over the years, and that's Bill Dickinson. And he's got something to talk to you about. It's a bit of a smuggler's tan. My name's Ronan Chantry. In Ireland, the wee laddie ended up in Georgia. One of the brethren of the coast.
Don't know what this is, but. <laughs> The sea, my mistress is the sea, the open seas, and every place that the sea kisses the land, that's a port, ports in the sea. Too many don't understand the importance of the sea and those ports. It's right and proper that that you recognize Lyman Hall. Lyman Hall brought ideas, principles from New England, Wallingford. He also knew something about the sea. When he moved to Georgia, he owned a plantation. The product was rice and indigo. He owned property in Sunbury. Sunbury was a port, a port on St. Catherine's Sound, with the island of Sosaba and St. Catherine's Island protecting the approaches. At one point, Sunbury was the rival of Savannah, a little ways to the north. He shipped rice and other produce from that port, and I, a sailor, I've sailed catches, yawls, brigs, brigantines, barks, barkantines, and schooners anywhere you might want. And our ships were the fastest and the best managed of any of the ships that plied the sea. So, Lyman Hall initially was pushing for independence, unlike most Georgians. We, the Brethren of the Coast, were brothers with Dr. Hall. December 10th, 1773. December 10th, 1773 the Boston Tea Party. Oh, the reverberations from that, the chaos that came from that. The world was on fire. Why? Because King George III, British monarchy, decided Boston must be punished and Parliament, which acted as a handmaiden to the king, adopted the so-called Intolerable Acts. It was the Boston Port Act. It closed the port. He sent men of war, warships, to seal the port off. No more trade. Soldiers were sent. Part of that act said soldiers could be quartered in civilians' homes. The act also took away the upper house of the legislature in Massachusetts and had the king appoint the upper house rather than the lower house electing the upper house. Talk about outrageous. Dr. Hall was livid. If you could close Boston, why not New York? Why not Philadelphia? Why not Sunbury? Where does it end? No trade and livelihoods are lost. Export import values in 1774 totaled 4.5 trillion pound, million pounds sterling from the colonies, from England to the colonies, colonies back to England. A lot of money. And the colonists weren't about to risk that. So what did, what did Dr. Hall do about it? Not only did he meet and stir up 
stir up the people of Georgia. But he and others shipped 579 barrels of rice to Boston, August 1774. He did something about it. And that was repeated in March of 1775. Another 160 barrels and 50 pounds sterling went to Philadelphia because by that time you couldn't get through the ships, British ships outside of Boston. It went to Philadelphia and ultimately for the aid of Boston. A man of action and principle. So a little bit about the trade. The British government prohibited, and this was from the very beginning, prohibited, prohibited any trade between the colonies and any other country other than Britain. Britain owned the colonies, no trading with French, Spain, Danish, Dutch, no trading. Now, as a brethren of the coast, I can be honest with you, as long as you don't tell no one about this, even during the French and Indian War, which ended in 1763, 56 to 73, even in those times, a number of us who remain unnamed were sailing to the Caribbean islands, the sugar islands, and doing all kinds of trade with French, Spanish, Dutch. You just had to make sure you had the right paperwork. Every ship went out with paperwork showing that it was British. And then you'd go to St. Nevis, and stopped by a customs official. That island was owned by the British with a little bribe. He'd verify that you traded all of your produce, might be rice, might be anything, to the British merchant. Proof from the customs official allowed you then, you sailed right on over to Caprasor, now Haiti, or one of the other islands, and you traded your cargo for a cargo to bring back, typically sugar or salt. Colonies used 1,500,000 1, bushels of salt a year. Turks and Caicos provided a lot of that. So this is all going on, and now when Britain wants to shut off all the trade, the warships were all over the Caribbean. It was dangerous work. You had privateers. Even Bermuda had some privateers seizing ships. The money made was unbelievable. So at one point, General Washington at Boston at that point, January 17, 75, 76. I have no shot, no powder. How do I fight a war? There's no way for me to be able to function. By July, he had so much shot and powder, he could have fought a, a battle every day from that to the end of 1776 and would still have shot and powder left over. How did that happen? Robert Morris, member of Congress, Dr. Hall, members of the Secret Committee and Correspondent, Secret Committee and Commerce. They saw to it that we were doing trading with the islands. And that's where we picked up the shot and the powder and brought them to our army. Our army, the revolution, could not have succeeded without what was being done on the sea. 
So how did it really work? At the same time, Britain was saying no trading with the, United, with the colonies. Bermuda sent a delegation to the Continental Congress asking, you can't shut us out. Because at that point, they were debating a non-importation. Couldn't import any, anything from a British possession. Bermuda, Jamaica, the Bahamas, they were terrified. Most of their food was a coming from the colonies. If they couldn't come and buy food, they'd starve. So Robert Morris and Hall and others added a little amendment to the non-importation that stated, if you was a coming to us with saltpeter, with sulfur, with powder, with shot, for any, with any war materials, you can exchange them for food. Now, can you imagine this? You had the governors of those British possessions coming to the United States, breaking the laws of Britain. I tell you, it was a world on fire. Tories, lo loyalists, Sons of Liberty, soldiers everywhere. What would be happening next? It was dangerous for everyone. But we did our part. Brethren of the Sea and Dr. Hall, it is good you remember him because he not only grasped the principles behind all of this, but he grasped because of his shipping and his interest in Sunbury, he understood the realities, the mechanics of it all. So I say three cheers for Dr. Hall. Hurrah! 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 And I thank you for your attention. Very good. Ladies and gentlemen, now we'll have uh, Mayor do a little proclamation here. Thank you. Um, as the only person who marched in here, uh, not dressed period correct, I want to apologize and explain <laughs> that um, Mayor Dickinson's costume closet did not come with the office. <laughs> but I do have a proclamation from the town. Whereas Lyman Hall was born on April 12, 1724, to parents John and Mary Street Hall of South Elm Street in Wallingford, Connecticut. And whereas after graduating from Yale College in 1747, Hall studied theology with his uncle Samuel Hall and became an ordained minister. And whereas while working as a minister, he studied medicine and taught school in Fairfield. And whereas Lyman Hall moved to Dorchester, South Carolina, where he set up his medical practice. And whereas in 1774, <laughs> he was granted land in the Midway section of Georgia, which became his plantation, Hall's Knoll. And Hall was an active leader in the revolutionary movement and was elected to represent Georgia in the Second Continental Congress in 1775. And whereas he later became governor of Georgia and one of the 56 men to sign the Declaration of Independence. And whereas the town of Wallingford has honored Hall's life and his contributions to the independence of our country with the Lyman Hall Memorial at the Center Street Cemetery and the naming of Lyman Hall High School. And whereas we are pleased that Lyman Hall's 300th birthday is being celebrated with a ceremony on the Center Street Cemetery on this day. I, Mayor of the Town of Wallingford, do hereby proclaim April 13th, 2024 as Lyman Hall Day in our community and ask that citizens join as we honor Lyman Hall's life and accomplishments. Thank you. So Mary Mashinsky, your lifelong friend of mine, state representative, and who did I call and say, do you have any friends in Georgia? What did Mary say right away? Of course I do. So Mary Mashinsky. Thank you, Bob. <clears throat> 
Uh, this is a citation from the state of Georgia, and I have to confess they didn't pass it yet. <laughs> they sent me the uh, they sent me the uh, interim resolution, which they have not yet voted. So when they vote it, we'll give the actual copy to you, I guess. This is a resolution celebrating the 300th anniversary of Lyman Hall's birthday and for other purposes. Whereas, born in Wallingford, Connecticut in 1724, Lyman Hall settled in Georgia in 1774, where he owned a plantation and practiced medicine. And whereas, as a fervent advocate for colonial self-government, Lyman became, began his political career in 1775, serving in the Second Continental Congress and playing a key role in supporting the Continental Army. And whereas he proved his dedication to his country as a signatory of the Declaration of Independence, and during the American Revolution, he suffered the loss of his property when the British captured Savannah, leading him to seek refuge in South Carolina and Connecticut. And whereas after the war, Lyman returned to Georgia, was elected governor in 1783, and later served in the Georgia General Assembly and Judiciary before retiring in the late 1780s and passing in 1790. And whereas his life and memory are commemorated in Wallingford, Connecticut, with a memorial at Center Street Cemetery and Lyman Hall High School. And whereas Lyman witnessed a dramatic change in the world over the course of his lifetime, and we salute his contribution to, the, to its progress through the tireless efforts on behalf of his community, state, and country. And whereas by the example Lyman Hall made of his life, he made this world a better place in which to live. And it is only fitting and proper that his legacy be appropriately honored. Now therefore, be it resolved that April 12, 2024, is celebrated as the 300th anniversary of the birthday of Lyman Hall in recognition of his dedicated, selfless, and distinguished service as a founding father of the United States. And this is introduced by Senator Nan Orock, District 36 of the Assembly in Georgia. The real one will come later when they vote it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So I need Jen Passerati and Tina and Kate, a lot of you are behind Lime Hall's monument. But I did make a blanket statement before about the people that are here to support us, and I should never make a blanket statement. So again, Mayor Dickinson, when you were mayor, you always were here. Mayor Cerevoni, we're happy that you're with us. Joe Marone, Town Council Chairman, Christina Tata, and then the Board of Education, Rajan, Ray Ross, and I'm missing one. She's behind me. <laughs> the reason why I have these ladies up here is because our next speaker is going to be Bob Beaumont. Bob Beaumont is the vice president of the Center Street Cemetery. He's also the president of the Historical Society. And uh, Bob is going to give you a portrait of Lyman Hall. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, I know, but I'm short. Good morning, one and all. Uh, you know, it's the first time I've been here since uh, well, probably about 2016 when I came to uh, help celebrate the 100th anniversary of the laying of the cornerstone at uh, what was then Lyman Hall High School. And I said then to the students who were there that one of the biggest honors I had wasn't just having a county name for me in Georgia or having a high school name for me in Georgia, but having a high school name for me here in Wallingford, my hometown, which I had not lived in for many years, to have to, to, to have been remembered by that, by the people of, of, of this fine town, was one of the highest honors that I could have had. That aside, a little bit about me, as was noted earlier, yes, I was born on August, on April 12th of uh, 1724, um, and I guess I'm 300 years and a day old at this point, but um, born, as was noted earlier, on, on, on South Elm Street, which was at one point known as Lower Street. Uh, there is a fenced-in area with a large boulder there directly across from 
Pat Wall Field that you would know it as. That was that was the site of my parents' house, John and Mary Street Hall. The younger brother's house is just a couple doors down. Went to school uh, on on South Main Street, or what you would know as South Main Street, almost across of what you would know of as the Walnut Historical Society. Actually, that building was built the same year I was born in 1724. So after. You know, after being a farm boy, after going to school there, I had the good fortune to be able to go to Yale. And Yale was a little bit different than it is, you know, than, than you might know it, because we didn't have in, teachers in all various subjects. We had a tutor that would follow us for each year that we were there. And then, on, then in the last year we were there, it would be the president of the college who would be the tutor. Uh, we learned. Hebrew, we learned Greek, Latin, etc. Uh, in addition to many other things, uh, ethics for one. When I graduated in 1747, I knew that I wanted to be a minister. Now, ministry was sort of in the blood, because my grandfather was Samuel Street, the first minister in your town of Wallingford. My uncle, Samuel Hall was the minister in what was known at that point as New Cheshire. I went to work with my uncle Samuel for the next two years to learn about the ministry, to become a minister. After becoming a minister in 1749, I ended up going down to Stratfield, uh, Stratfield being what is known today or what you might know of as Bridgeport. Uh, Bridgeport didn't exist, by the way, until 1835 as, a, as an entity. But I was there as, as the minister for a couple of years. And then yours truly got in a little bit of trouble. <laughs> Somebody uh, claimed that they saw me climbing out of the window of a house of a young lady that I might have known. Therefore, the, Fair, the Fairfield Association of the Congregational Church called me before it, and they were essentially were about to defrock me. However, because of my honest feelings of remorse for what I had done, uh, and believe me, I was very seriously upset with myself for having done what I did, uh, they decided that, well, they would let me go ahead and continue being a minister, but I would be an itinerant. So basically, if you will, my parish was taken away from me, but I could still go ahead and preach. And I did that. I would fill in in various places in, in the general area. Well, that was that was fine to a point. It, you know, it gave me doing, it got me doing something that I still like doing, which was helping people. But I also decided shortly thereafter that it was, you know, there was another way to help people. You know, I'd like to become a doctor. Well, they didn't have medical schools back in the 1750s. And what I ended up doing was I basically ended up learning from one of the senior doctors in the Stratfield area. And to go ahead and put bread right on the table, I was, I was a teacher in Fairfield. So I did that for, for about two years, and then I became, became a doctor. During that time period, I married my first wife, Abigail Burr, and uh, I'm sorry to say she only lived for 14 months after we were married. Fine young girl. I later married Mary Osborne, and then Mary and I would spend the next 40 years together. Shortly after becoming a doctor, you know, after be basically learning what I needed to learn from the doctors in the Fairfield area, I moved back to Wallingford and opened up a practice here. Now, I was here for several years, and I guess sort of the wanderlust that I come by sort of naturally, namely that my great-grandfather John left England, came, came to Boston in 1633. 
then came down in a haven. Then later on, he and his son Samuel, my grandfather, came to Wallingford as, fo as founders of Wallingford. But I, so I guess that wanderlust sort of was in the blood. Uh, I decided uh, we would go down to Dorchester in South Carolina, a good Puritan development, a good, I should say, a good Puritan town. These people were mostly from Dorchester, Massachusetts. However, by the time I got there in the mid-1750s, most of the Puritans had started moving south to, to Georgia because there was more land available there. Well, I didn't stay in, you know, even though I opened a practice in Dorchester, I didn't stay there very long. As a matter of fact, it was probably less than a, it was less than a year before we moved down to Midway in Georgia, in St. John's Parish. Now, Midway was a bit on the swampy side, but the land on, you know, there was a lot of land available, and the land was great for raising indigo and for raising rice. I opened, up a, I opened up my medical practice there, built a house in Sunbury, uh, which was right on the coast, and was, you might have heard from a youngster a little bit earlier, became quite a, quite a, a booming port rivaling Savannah. Did very well as a, you know, as a planter, did very well as a doctor, took care of, took care of all the people in the area, be they white or be they Negro, uh, one, and, one and the same as far as I was concerned, take care of the people that need, that need help, that need medical attention. But, you know, one would think by the sound of what I've said, that it sounded like an ideal existence. But this was into the 1760s by now. And the British proceeded to go ahead and upset the apple cart. Because in 1765, they implemented the Stamp Act. The Stamp Act went into effect on November 1st of 1765. Stamps arrived in Georgia in December of that year. Uh, you say stamps. Well, what do you mean? Uh, well, any legal document, and that was whether it was a deed, whether it was a contract, even a newspaper was supposed to have a stamp on it. And that stamp, in, in order to have that stamp, there was a duty or tax that was paid. The British government did this with the idea of trying to get money back for the expense that they had expended during the French and Indian War. There were a batch of us who really didn't like that. Matter of fact, when the stamps arrived from England in Savannah, within the, within the week, there was a march, a protest march of 200 men. We burned the tax collector in effigy and threatened to go ahead and take the warehouse over where the Brits were storing the stamps. In a very short period of time, I think it was about a week later, the British proceeded to go ahead, pack up the stamps, take them back to England. Now, less than a month later, something happened here in your town. And that's when the Sons of Liberty came through Wallingford. I believe it was January 13th of 1776. There was a town meeting that day. And there were three major resolves that came out of that town meeting. One, that your people voted that it was unconstitutional to lay this tax on, on the people of the, of the colonies. And essentially what, they were, what the British were trying to do was to enslave them. Second, second resolve was Anybody who is caught using a stamp on any sort of paper will be prosecuted. When I say prosecuted, they would have been fined. They were fined, and that money was to go, any of that fine money was to go to help out any of the poor that were in the town. And the third one 
is really in some ways the most important because it shows you what your ancestors and some of my family felt. The third resolve was, in the extreme, we will take the field to stop the implementation of the Stamp Act. In other words, if need be, you would go ahead and fight the British to stop the implementation of the Stamp Act. Because of that, and I, I might add, Wallingford was the, my understanding, was, was the first town to have a meeting like this in the colony. Wallingford came to be known as the cradle of American liberty because of what action they took in January of 1766. As an aside, I might say, St. John's Parish in Georgia came to be known as the cradle of liberty also for a different reason. But that was based on the number, uh, because of the number of judges, senators, governors that came out of St. John Parish. So there, are some sim there were some similarities there. Well, time went on. You heard mention a little bit earlier about the Intolerable Acts. The Intolerable Act essentially closed the port of Boston. Well, we wanted to do something about this, and actually what, what we wanted to do was we wanted to go ahead and send representation initially to the First Continental Congress in 1774. Uh, the Assembly got together, we met, we, we discussed it, but the Assembly basically caved in to the royal governor's demands that nothing be done. That being said, there were a group of us fair-sized group of us who met at Toynbee's Tavern, and we wanted to defend, if you will, America. A lot of us were from St. John Parish. We were Puritans. We had that New England mentality of freedom, which was not quite as prevalent in the colony of Georgia as it certainly was in Connecticut and Massachusetts. We formed, we formed a committee to go ahead and communicate or write letters to the other colonies. This was, this was a typical thing that, that was done uh, in all of the colonies so that we were all communicating with each other. That was one thing we did. Another thing we did is we decided that we would send, we would help out the people of Boston. And that's how we ended up sending some 579 barrels of rice, much of which came from my plantation and others in St. John Parish. And I believe you may have heard from a young fellow earlier, and I'm not too sure about what he may have taken some of that rice up to, up, up to Boston, or at least part way up there. And it was greatly appreciated because we wanted to help our brethren out. When we couldn't go to the congregation, Continental Congress, I contacted some of my counterparts in South Carolina asking if we could go ahead and work with them. Uh, and they said, well, you know, and actually one other thing, I, when, we, when, when the Non-Importation Act came into effect, it meant that not only could would the colonies not trade with England anymore, but they wouldn't trade with Georgia because we weren't part of the we weren't part of the group that was in agreement to not to do you know to not trade with England. I tried to go ahead and work my way around that with South Carolina and say, look, is there a way that we can go ahead and have St. John Parish and one other? Can we trade with you? We, you know, we don't really want to be part of this. We don't believe in what what the rest of Georgia is doing. They said, no, we, you know, we can't carve it out. Our interpretation of the Non-Importation Act is that we, we, you know, we really can't carve out part of a colony. Well, that, that, but the comment I will make is what, what they suggested is that we send representation to the Continental Congress that was coming up. This would be the second Continental Congress that we send representation up to there. 
we had a convention. I was I was uh, elected as the as a delegate to the Second Continental Congress. Went up there, presented my credentials on June 14th of 1775, which just happened to be, as it turned out, three days before the Battle of, of, Bun of Bunker Hill. In presenting my credentials, there was a bit of a conundrum that, that the other delegates had, the other colonies had. That being, what do we do with this man? He's just representing two parishes. We really can't have him vote on, you know, on everything. So I made a suggestion to, to them that, look, I would like to be able to participate. I would be happy to vote on things that are, did not require a colony vote. Any colony vote, any vote, anything that requires a colony vote, I would not vote on. Having said that, I did add that I thought that the colony of Georgia would be on board and be in the fold in a short period of time. One, they went ahead and agreed to have me allowed to speak and have limited capabilities in there, which was which was really all I was asking for, which is all which is all I could have expected. They then there's and then probably within, I think it was within three to four weeks, the colony of Georgia, after A, having heard about Lexington and Concord, B, about Bunker Hill and Fort Ticonderoga, decided that they would join the fold. Well, as a result of that, uh, they appointed five people to come up as as delegates, yours truly being one of them. Uh, me, none of the others did come up immediately, but one thing they did do is immediately was to go ahead and rescind the Non-Importation Act as far as how it impacted Georgia. So that as of early July of 1775, Georgia was allowed to trade with the other colonies. Beginning of beginning of 1776, Button went up and George Walton, Button, my one of my dearest friends, uh, and George Walton were appointed as delegates to join me in in the Continental Congress in Philadelphia. And in May of that year, when they arrived when they arrived up there, I took them to meet people such as Roger Sherman, who is one of your delegates here from Connecticut, and an old classmate of mine, Dr. Oliver Wilkett, also known as General Wilkett. We met with them and got to the point where we were pretty much in step with, what, with Connecticut. So much so that a representative from North Carolina, one Thomas Burke said, the only thing that Georgia is good for is to vote with Connecticut. Well, that may have been the case, but you know something, folks? I think it worked out pretty doggone well over time. And because oh, we did, we were sort of the odd one out in some cases with regard to some of the others in the South. But we all managed to go ahead and work together in the end. July 3rd, we passed the Declaration of Independence. August 2nd of 1776, everybody signed it. And what that basically meant is that we were, all of us who signed it, all 56 of us, 48 of whom who had been born here on this side of the Atlantic, we were all basically putting our lives, our fortunes, our families in harm's way. Well, <clears throat> I continued in the I continued in the um, Continental Congress up until about 1780. Uh, 1778, I ended up going back down back home, getting my wife and son, and moving north. Fortunately, you know this was just ahead of the British invasion down there. My house in Midway, you know, my plantation in Midway, and my house and all of Sunbury 
were burned down by the British. So I lived, I ended up living up north for about four years. At the end of the, at the end of the war, in 1782, I went back down there to go ahead and reconstruct my life in, in Georgia. And it, would, it took some time. I was able to get my practice going. I was able to get my land back uh, because the Tory who, 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 to whom it had been given had fled the country along with most of the other Tories and the, you know, when the British left. So January of 1783, I was elected governor for one year. It was arguably one of the most daunting tasks that I had ever had in my life. The colony of Georgia was essentially bankrupt. We had no money. I had to figure a way to go ahead and raise money without overtaxing people because they didn't have the money to do so. There were major issues with regard to getting property back to people from whom it had been taken. That process got started during my, during my year as governor. Certainly did not get completed because it, it, there, was just, there were so many people, so many properties involved. The other thing that another thing that was done was we signed peace treaties with the Creeks and the Cherokees. Both both of tribes had been on the side of the British, so that worked out. And one thing that I'm really quite proud of, managed to set aside some land. You might say, well. What's the big deal about that? Well, we set aside land for a college. That college was, Frank, was Franklin College, which, years, which a number of years later would become the University of Georgia, essentially the first land-grant state university in the, in the country. Because I believe that it was necessary to have a well-educated, religious-related edu religious education in order for the people, not just of Georgia, but for all the colonies to have that type of education so that they would be able to go ahead and properly run the country, the brand new country. I spent that one year as governor, and at the end of that, I stepped back from public service. Uh, I did, get, I did get involved with, with some things later on in the courts, uh, but primarily I went back to my plantation, I went back to my medical practice. Now, one of your fine gentlemen from this state is unique, and that is Roger Sherman. He was mayor in New Haven at the time that he was, you know, that he was in the Continental Congress. Well, he signed all four major documents that helped to make this country. He signed the uh, Continental Association Agreement in the first Continental Congress. Certainly was a signer of the Declaration of, of, of Independence. Signed the Articles of Confederation. And is largely responsible for the Connecticut Compromise in the Constitution, which allowed for there to be two two senators from each colony or each state, and then that there would be representation based on population for the House of Representatives. So the man from Connecticut was a very important individual, and I'm very proud to have claimed him as a friend. Moving on a little bit, I ended up in 1790 selling Paul's Knoll, which is what my 550 50-acre prop property was known as. And I bought Shell Bluff. Well, that was all well and good, folks, but I never got to live at Shell Bluff because I passed that year. But one thing I want to mention to you is something that I mentioned to the students at Lyman Hall when I gave, when I gave a talk to them back in 2016. Something to always remember. And you're having about as good a time as you like. The paper. That being, <laughs> as a minister, I 
hope you I hope you try your utmost to live a good life doing your best for your family and your fellow man. As a teacher, I urge you to remember that learning does not end when your schooling is over, but continues in for your entire life. Striving to learn more about whatever you are involved with can only make you a better person and be of more value to your family and society. As a doctor, I urge you to treat your body and mind with the utmost respect so that you may have a long, healthy life. And as a leader of the community, I urge you to do your best to give back to your community to help make it a better place in which to live. Thank you very much for having me. God bless. So we're almost uh, finished with the ceremony. Couple things I want to recognize here. These gals here, Jen and the two Beaumont ladies, are part of the DAR, Daughters of America Revolution. Now, without all of you here today, this wouldn't happen. And I certainly appreciate it. And I'll also reach out to Bob Gross. He's here hiding somewhere. He's the president of our Center Street Cemetery. I am about to retire the colors. After retiring the colors, the Ellsville Fife and Trump Corps will be gracious enough to play one more tune for us. So, Color Guard. Right face. Retire to colors. Everyone, again, thank you so much for taking the time out on this Saturday. I know we're all busy, and Yells would like to hear a beautiful tune from you guys. Thank you.